So let's jump right in. I have I have organized this in a top 10 list and you'll you'll see it going in order and I bet you can imagine you have asked some of these questions as well. So we're just going to start with number one, which is how many shoes do you have? I bet you predicted this one. How many shoes do you have and how much leather is in the collection? This is by far the most common question that we get. And really the answer is that we are indeed still counting. So we know that we have currently, unless, I don't know, Andy, did you find any leather lasted here in your, in your few little dips and dives? Okay, excellent. Whew. We have currently 7,315 discrete leather small fine numbers. Now, what that means is that we have allotted that many numbers. That could include, though, more pieces than you can quite imagine. Some of those numbers are bags of scraps or offcuts. And what you're seeing on the top right here is one of those bags, actually one of the smaller of the bags. We keep all the scraps, all the offcuts, all the bits, and they go into a bag and they are recorded from their context. They don't get an exact fine spot, but from their context, um, which will be a small area on the excavation. And at some point, somebody, not me, is going to look through all of those, those scraps and, and offcuts. And, and you actually can, there's a great deal of information. There's information about um, how they were sewing these, uh, how they were sewing leather, how they were working leather, how the offcuts tell us about shoe manufacturing and other kinds of manufacturing, because we see the, the little bits and pieces. So there could be several small items under that one number. Some of those numbers will be a series of tent panels that all fit together, for instance. And I'm not sure if we have Carol Vandal Murray on, on, the, on the call today here, but um, she is somebody who has put together tent panels and done some incredible work with that. So we might have one number that has tent panels. Many of these though, as you know, are shoes or even just a, a small fine number is a patch or um, recently you may have heard about the little leather mouse, the little leather mouse that, that we found that I believe is a mouse indeed. Um, we have, in terms of shoes, everybody wants to know about the shoes. And so I've actually focused in about on the shoes for this talk. We have around 5,000 leather shoes. And I'm still saying around because we are still working in the, organizing the database right now. And we are almost at that point where I get to go tickety, tickety, tickety and say, how many shoes do we have? And the database will tell me. So we are actually very, very close to that point. What it will tell me is how many shoes we have how many shoe uppers we have, how many shoe scraps we have, that kind of thing. So we're going to get numbers soon. So next time I do this talk, I will have, you know, it'll be something much looking more like 7,315 leather fine numbers. Um, some of those are complete shoes, um, also layers, uppers, and others are fragmentary. So you'll see even through this talk, of course, I've picked out all of the very, very nice, lovely ones to show you. But there are thousands of shoes that are in um, uh, slightly different repair. I'm, I'll put it that way. Okay, so that's how many we have. Why? The next most popular question, absolutely hands down, why are all those shoes preserved at Vindolanda? And a follow-up question that I have heard so many times is, was it a shoe production site? It was not a shoe production site. And we will get to the question, were the shoes made at Vindolanda? That's another one. But it is not a shoe production site in the sense that, um, you know, we're not in Northampton or anything right now. Um, What's going on with the shoes and the leather generally at Vindolanda is that we have this really exceptional preservation in the soil called anaerobic, sometimes called anoxic, if, uh, if Bob Hefford is on the, on the talk here. Um, the archaeological environments don't basically, they essentially don't have any oxygen getting in. What that means is that bacteria that lives off oxygen that typically would break down something organic like leather or um, bone, which is a little bit more robust anyway, but, um, and wooden objects, those remain at Vindolanda, not throughout the entire site. For those of you who have excavated, you know that, that, you know, you, you time your, your summer period well, so that you can get into that gooey stuff, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but down underneath a lot of these stone remains um, out in the extramural settlement and inside of the fort, we've got these anaerobic layers, and they are just really, really brilliant at um, preserving leather. What I'm going to show you, actually, I'm going to go back to that slide right there just again quickly. This slide is wonderful to show you 
just to show you the contrast between the different kinds of excavation. So you've got your very dry upper, um, really just top soil up here, but even, even still lower, some drier material. You can really see the difference in that dark excavation that we're doing here. That's a ditch fill. And that gives you a sense that's all going to be anaerobic or at least semi-anaerobic usually in the ditches. And that's, that's this ditch fill that where we find a lot of shoes. So that's, you can really get a vision from that image there about the different stuff. There are also different kinds of contexts. We do find thousands of shoes and ditches, that is quite right. But what makes Mindelanda special in another sense is that we have a lot of um, both domestic contexts, buildings just generally, that often preserve shoes in their original context of use. And that's really exciting for an archeologist because it means it's not just showing us a discard pattern. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side here, you guys see my, my cursor if I'm over here on this screen? Yep, okay. Thank you, Mandy. On the left-hand side, you're seeing um, some of you, if you're looking at that thinking that's familiar, this is the 2003 excavation. And we were down finding those water pipes, but this is what it looks like when we start to find all of those timber walls that are really outlining where the buildings and where the internal walls were located. And you can see all these little white tags, that's all going to mark, all of those will mark a, an upright um, timber post. And so we're able within those those habitational layers, we're able to shoes come out of those and we're able to say that with, you know, pretty good likelihood, the shoes that were found in these spaces and the other artifacts as well were actually being used in those spaces for the most part. And we've done a lot of work looking at the sort of patterns of deposition at Vindolanda. And there are spaces where we can absolutely say these are the domestic spaces and the habitational debris from sort of day-to-day -day life and other places that are, are built up and there's something different. So we're very lucky at Vindolanda to have that. Also the image on the right is some of the extramural period four that we found back in 2012-13 that also gives us that idea of a habitational space. Now at the same time, we have other spaces other than ditches that will show us a discard pattern. And that's something right here. Some of you might remember uh, Alex down a well in 2004 down wells, we find shoes. Um, you know, you're not going to find 500 down a well, although somebody probably has actually. Um, a site like the Salzburg in Germany, they found lots and lots of shoes down the wells. Um, so this is an intentional deposition as well. Whether we're talking about something ritual or not, we're not really going to go there, or whether it's just kind of regular discard. But wells and pits are other places where you can find shoes that you might have this anaerobic type of situation. So the length of habitation at Vindolanda is one reason why we have so many shoes. If you have a, a bunch of people living there for hundreds and hundreds of years, the shoes date from about the late uh, first century, a little into the fourth century. Um, we don't, we, we have habitation beyond that, but we don't have these anaerobic situations where we're gonna get leather. So, but you know, several hundred years, you're gonna have several thousand shoes if you have the right conditions. And that's why, and Vindolanda has those conditions and that's why we have so much leather. So no, not a shoe production site, but um, yes, a very, very exciting um, kind of excavation. And just to put that into perspective, back in 2016, we excavated a Severan ditch and uh, the one on the south side of the fort. And you're looking at the profile here. So up on the top, corner, you've got the full profile. And then if we just zoom in here, what you can't see in this image, and you probably can't even tell in this image, all these little bits that are sticking out, a lot of them are rocks, yes, but a lot of them are actually shoes. They're, they're, they're toes and bits of shoes sticking out. So that one right there. Now I have to confess, this shoe right here is not the exact shoe, that one right there. These are all shoes though that came out of the Severan period ditch. Um, so they're all that early third century. And what, we're, what we were calling this at the time, this seems to be an abandonment horizon. In other words, in the archeology, span you have a layer where into this ditch went all of the things that that Severan period um, unit did not want when they left. And when they leave, they chuck it all into the ditch, including all the shoes that were worn out and they're thinking, you know, I don't need to carry this for the next haul, you know? And just in this narrow band in the ditch right here, we found hundreds, I think something like 420 shoes and even more leather, 480 leather numbers. So, you know, the potential there, and this is just one little section. We've also found shoes in this um, section of ditch back in 2002 and in 2004. 
So it's been quite, um, it's been quite a prolific section that southern, southern side of the Severum ditch. But that's the kind of thing, it's an abandonment horizon when we're talking about ditch shoes and this profile of, of, um, of deposition and discard basically rather than habitational. So that is why we have all these shoes. We have great preservation, people threw their shoes away, they're preserved for us. Also, I might point out, we're excavating, right? We've been excavating every year for decades. If you excavate, you will find new data and you will have interesting things to, you know, create these robust scenes of life in antiquity. So, little plug for excavation. Um, this is a common question, ready? Number three, we get, are there more lefts or rights and then a follow-up is, or are they mostly in pairs? Now, what's funny is that a lot of people say to me when they're chatting and they, oh, okay, so how many pairs of shoes do you have? And I say, oh, well, hang on, they're, they're not all pairs. We do actually have a good number of pairs. It's not that we only have one or two. We have a good number of pairs. Um, but I will say the vast majority are singles. Now saying that at the same rate, there are probably so many pairs in the uh, in the record that we actually can't identify, right? Because if you, let's say, think of that ditch and it goes in and your one shoe is over here and another shoe kind of makes its way down with a, a big storm and it's 20 feet away, they are actually gonna see different taphonomic processes, those, that thing that happens after it goes into the archeological record. So they're gonna look very different when they come to us. One might be really well-preserved, the other might be very degraded and we'll never recognize that that is um, a pair. So we always want to remember that, but the, the pairs that we do have are sometimes just quite spectacular. So on the left and the right, these are um, two wonderful ones um, from way back, let's see, three, seven, seven, five, and six. That'll be from the early 90s, I believe, late 80s, early 90s. And that's just a lovely pair of um, probably adolescent shoes um, worn by an adolescent. Uh, you've got your vamp seam here. You can just see so much. You can, you know, you look at it and you say, oh yeah, those are some great shoes. And then a similar kind of thing. But actually, once we had one of the specialists, uh, a woman named Marquita Vulcan looked at this, um, who really specializes in the, the, the way they're, they're making the shoes. She said, it's actually quite rare that we don't have the seam right here that you can see very clearly on this one here. Um, one of the earliest pairs or, or even shoes, individual shoes that she's ever seen without that. So that's quite interesting. So Vindolanda, the scope of this, this, this assemblage allows us and, and anybody else who's gonna be researching it to really find new and interesting things. So it's a really important assemblage. Um, so two just wonderful cracking pairs right there. But then this one in the middle, I just wanted to throw that in to demonstrate that thing where you know, you don't necessarily, it was obvious to me because I had this, um, you know, I'm cataloging and I catalog number 47 and didn't take a tea break in between, which means I very quickly came up to 52 and went, hang on, I swear I just saw this, you know, and then you can start putting things together. Had I taken lunch in between these two, it might have been more difficult <laughs> to actually put that together. But that's one of the points of the database is to have, you know, eyes on all of these things at once. Um, so, um, so we have a lot of pairs. Yes, indeed. We probably have more than we ever know. We do, however, find a lot of singles as well. That's, a, that's mostly what we have in the assemblage, our single shoes. Um, can I just throw a little reminder out there to put, your, um, your, put yourself on mute if you're uh, able to. Thank you very much. Um, okay, number four. This is one of my favorites. Um, did people fix their shoes or just throw them out when they were worn? The answer is a little bit of both actually. And what I might throw in here, cause I'm not really talking about the people very much other than the shoes that they were wearing. But what I might throw out here is it all depends. Your whole experience in antiquity depends on class, status, social status, right? If you have the money to have, wear your shoes and just say, mm, you know, I don't need these anymore and throw them away, then you're just gonna throw them away, right? But we always wanna remember intersectionality, which is a word we've heard a lot lately. We always want to remember that there are different people always on any archaeological site. So some people are in the position where they very much need to fix those shoes and use them as long as they possibly can. So I have a couple of examples for you. This one is always fantastic. Um, this is a carbatina right here where you can see the 
little lines, that, 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 all of those. There was a big patch on the back side there. And that was really cool because it really demonstrated that anyone who's found a carpatina or seen one in the museum or in a book somewhere, the carpatina is the shoe that does not have iron hobnails. It's the kind of house slipper. It's sort of a, a shoe that would be worn perhaps we think inside, indoors maybe. Because as soon as you go outdoors, you are going to wear out the heel or the toe or both. And very often when they're in discard and we see them chucked away, they are always worn out in one or both of those spots. Now, this individual decided they really needed to get a bit more life out of these things. Because the lovely thing about carbatinas is that the, I should say carbatini, is that they can kind of expand and contract with the, the growing foot. Well, okay, they, they could contract, I suppose, but hopefully your feet aren't contracting. But if your shoe, if your foot um, grows, let's say you're 12, next thing you know, you're 14 and you've grown, you know, two sizes, um, you might be able to just get a little bit within reason, of course, a little bit more life out of the carbatina because you can loosen up the laces. You can just, it's got a little bit more give than say a shoe with hobnails and the whole kind of, um, the whole thing. So they put a patch on it here and they really made sure that they can um, get, get a little bit more life out of that. This one on the right here, this is a different kind of, of fix. What's going on here is the individual, and this is, a, again, there's no scale on this one, I do apologize, but this is a, a, probably an adolescent shoe. It has been cut out here. So it looks a lot more like what we would, I think, today call a mule. I'm not really, a, this is funny, I'm not really a shoe person. I don't really wear, I've been wearing the same shoes for a year since, <laughs> since this quarantine started, and it's mostly just my comfy slippers or my comfy boots one or the other. Um, so I'm not much of a shoe. So this I think is called a mule where you have the full front and then your back is open. Well, it wasn't originally like that. The shoe has been cut all along here and especially around the back here. And this always cracks me up because this individual, you know, just decided, hey, I need a little bit more use out of this shoe. I'm just gonna cut out the back. My heel might hang off the back, but you know, it's, it's the best I can do right now. So those are always really interesting. And we have another one that um, I just was reminded of recently and I had a little post note on my wall, you know, oh, show everybody that one for the talk. And that's this right here from 2012. And here's the whole shoe. You've got the, the um, outer sole, so you can see the hobnails there, interestingly, just around the outside edge. And then the upper is looking a little scraggly, but the reason why this is so interesting, if we zoom in on that area, we're looking at that right there. And everyone has probably already notice that it's got these patch marks, these sewn, you know, the, the stitch holes. And so we had a patch over this part of the shoe. And in the assemblage of this shoe, we actually have the patches. So there's this little, little one right here and that smaller one here as well. And I think there might've been a third one actually, because that doesn't look like the end of that one exactly. But I think we had another one. Um, so we see that they are in fact patching up this looks like it was was cut out a little bit um, but that is something that you want to do when you patch something right you don't want to just patch a scraggly thing because it won't really hold together well you want to kind of cut it clean it up and then you patch over that hole so you don't have a lot of sort of doubled up leather you know what I mean um, so that clearly there are there's a certain number of people that would need to would want to patch up their shoes reuse them as long as they possibly can so yes they did fix their shoes However, other people are just throwing them away. We certainly see discard that reflects just, you know, maybe a little thing wrong with the shoe, or maybe I just can't be bothered to carry this to the next station, um, like we saw in, in, in the ditches. So that is what's happening there. Um, the next one, number five, did they have changing fashions or are the shoes standard army issue? Again, the answer is a little bit of both. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely fashion. We have fashion, we have, we have fashions changing. We have um, different kinds of things in style at the same time. We have different people owning different types of shoes. So one quick glance um, at these, these shoes right here, will show you that we clearly, what you're looking at here are just the, the sole unit. So the sole units are really robust. And they can take a lot of wear and tear and still come through to us in pretty decent condition. And that's really great because 
that helps us with, with these issues of demography. So the reason why I was looking at shoes for my PhD was in fact to really get out the demography of a Roman fort, one that we could have a lot of information from, any, everything from the shoes to the writing tablets to small finds. And the, it's really the insole that we need. It's this sole unit that we need to be able to make a really good sense of, of, of who is wearing these shoes. So what you're looking at here though, however, when we think about demography, in other words, when we think about the, the size of the shoe, we also need to bring fashion into this question. Because you can see from this in the, these three sole units right here that things are changing from the early second century. You've got a pretty sort of rounded toe, not entirely rounded. You can still tell that this is a left foot. Um, you can, oh, speaking of lefts, I forgot to say, do we have more lefts or rights? I don't know. I'm still counting. Another question that the database is going to tell us. So as soon as that database is ready, I'm going to also say lefts, rights, because we can very often, usually we can tell if it's a left or a right. Um, there are other Roman shoes where you can't tell if it's a left or a right. But here at Vindolanda, our time period, the types of shoes we have, you can, you can usually tell. So this one here, you can see that you've got a right foot, but we also have a very kind of rounded toe. Then if we jump to period six, so that's our mid second century, mid to late, depending on what, what level of the ditch you're talking about. I'm just keeping it general here. It's getting a bit more elongated. And, and I should stress also that not every shoe that we find from this period is going to follow. But as a general trend, what we're seeing is things getting a little bit more elongated, a little bit more pointed, and then when we get to the early third century at Vindolanda, so our period 6B, that's our Severan period, you've probably heard us refer to at some point, shoes are very, very pointy. And then actually, again, in the third century, they shift over to, um, they shift back to a more kind of rounded. But so we end up with this very pointed shoe. And when you think about how that has to come through stylistically, that would look very, very different when you get that upper on there and everything. And I'm gonna show you some uppers in just a minute so we can see the full range of styles. But even just looking at the shoe sole unit, you can tell we have different styles here. But I also wanted to show you these to point out that we can't always tell the style, right? We can see surely that from this shoe to that shoe, it's going to look physically different and stylistically different. But in fact, we can't really categorize what sort of shoe it is because we're only, we only have the sole unit. So what we need for that, luckily, at Vindolanda, we have loads of great examples of complete shoes that are really able to tell us a lot about, you know, who was wearing it in terms of, is this a very nice shoe? Is this sort of a bog standard shoe? That kind of thing. So what you're looking at here, a couple of shoes from 2016, and then some of um, the earlier shoes, again, actually one of the very earlier shoes you can see again, 1987. But just to show you the different kind of styles, and this is quite literally a, you know, a drop in the bucket here. This is only four of, I could have shown you the whole thing and then there's this style and then there's that style. But what I've done here is pulled this terrific image from Carol Vandrill Murray's book. Um, it's a, it's um, a, a, a volume, a tri tri triple author volume, but the Roman part is by Carol and it's called Stepping Through Time. And if you're just interested in shoes, it's an absolutely fantastic buy. Um, it's got medieval um, and uh, Roman and then also Iron Age by Gubitz and Joe Murray and um, uh, Vatsaringa. So this is a great find right here to, if, you're, if you're looking for more reads. But you can just see from this, this image from Carol's um, diagram of shoe types through time, you basically kind of go like this in time, up or down. And you have just so many different, you've got all of your different variations of the kind of ubiquitous military boot that you hear about, or you've got these low shoes and some of them are decorated and some of them are not so decorated. You've got the laces. We have a number of these at Vindolanda and we do not have others of these at Vindolanda. So the Vindolanda shoes that just as a little highlight, just to show you the different kinds of styles that we might get are you know, anything from a high military boot, a well-decorated high boot. So something here, you've got all these intricate cutouts, which is clearly going to be different from, um, you know, just your regular military boot, which you see kind of right there in the diagram. Um, but then something that's a little bit more interesting, um, probably more of a third century shoe, because this is out of the Severan period ditch, both of these, a kind of something between a boot and a low ankle shoe, right? We, there's, there's sort of something else going on there. You've got a bit of decoration on this one here. 
Um, so fashion certainly played a part in this. Um, and at other times it did not. You also are going to see a kind of military standard issue in something like the military boots that you see drawn over here. And I will show you some of those. We, we have plenty of those in Rwanda. I just didn't put them on this slide. Um, so really the, the extent, it would be impossible to say that there was no care for, for fashion just because of the extent of the, the range of, of the variety of types that we have. Um, and some of them are absolutely amazing. I didn't really point out the sandal. Look at this amazing little cute sandal here with all of its uppers and, and that's very delicately put together. It actually doesn't have any hobnails, even though it does have, um, it's not a single piece. It has shoe uh, sole layers put together. So it must've been held together by something other than hobnails, um, but also not, uh, there, there's a little bit of sewing. You can see some marks. Um, but not extensively sewn together either. So all sorts of amazing things and different kinds of shoes. And if we only need to actually look at one type of shoe to show the range of styles even within a type of shoe. And what you're looking at here is a range of sandal styles that change through time. And I used another one of Carol's diagrams because it really lays out. You can see the time down here, the period. So 100 CE, 120 CE and all the way up here. Um, into the fourth century. And you start out with shoes that look, the sandals, just the, the range of sandals that look like this. And we have a lot of those at Vindalanda. Um, the Lepidina slipper that everybody, you know, is, is I think very, very familiar with um, at this point. That is this exact kind of, of, of cutout. And then you move up through time where you have sandals that have a very simple layout that would look very much like any other shoe. And you see that one right here or the cutout of the toes gets a little bit uh, more simplified. So you've got the big toe up here, you've got the little thong. Now, how do we know it's a sandal? You have a little cutout here for the thong. And in fact, in this case, the thong was preserved. It just, it, it was next to it basically came off. Um, and then that's beautifully, um, uh, what do you guys call it? We call it braided, you guys call it uh, plated, plated. Um, and then you move through time and, and you get sort of blunted up at the toe here and you can still make out that little bit of toe over here, a little bit of toe, but things change. And then you get this very flat end. And I wanted to show you this as well because we don't have any perfect examples at Vindalanda, but we do have examples. By the fourth century, oh, I should also say that um, sandals early on were for women and then they shift actually into a, a man's shoe as well, into a style, women still wear them, but into more of a man's style. And when we get to the fourth century, you have these huge, they're, they're paddle-like. I mean, you could practically play ping pong with these things. Um, and we do have some of those at Vindalanda. Uh, most of our examples, though, are, are partial. So um, I was keeping the very nice shoes in here, of course. But I wanted you to see this on Carol's diagram, that they just get completely absurd. I mean, no foot was really, you know, in there. You might even look at it and think that there was, you know, something perhaps going wrong with that individual. But nope, they're just, it's just a stylistic change. Um, so just in, even just in sandals, you can see this range of style and how things shift through time. So that's what's going on with fashion. Definitely a fashion sense. Um, things could shift, you know, quickly. Um, if you want to learn more about this and sort of timing and how things shift, there's a great article again by Carol Vandrell Murray in Britannia from 19, no, 2000, either 2000 or 2001, Britannia. Um, and it's, it's Vindalanda and, and the dating of Roman footwear. It's a really fantastic article. And you can really talk, you can see how things change and how shoes could actually be a, a dating tool because of the changing styles. So very cool. Um, all right, number six, how were Roman shoes made and, and held together? So, you know, are we dealing with something very, very simple um, or do we have something very intricate? And again, the answer is kind of a bit of everything. So Romans did have a very uh, standard kind of basic organization um, in, in, in one sense. Um, and in another sense, and I'll, and I'll talk about both of these styles, um, but in another sense, they were, it was very intricate and there were a lot of moving parts in these shoes. And something I'm working on right now for, for a project website is to have um, a drawing actually where the shoe is exploded and you can kind of see all of the different elements and then it can come back together again. That's uh, of course, I'm setting a graduate student to do that for me because that is beyond my, <laughs> my capabilities. Um, but there are so many moving parts in some of the shoes and in others, there's literally one single piece of leather and then laced up. So I'll show you all of this. Um, right here, you're looking at on the bottom left, you're looking at 
a, a very standard um, manufacturing style, you know, uh, it, with layers of thick cowhide, typically cowhide, because that's a very thick hide. They were sewn or nailed together with these hobnails. So you can see the hobnails just peeking out here. There's another one there, um, which that then created the outer surface. So you're looking at the side of a shoe here and what you're seeing up above where my cursor is, that is called the heel stiffener. And that is, um, we actually have them in our shoes as well. It's a sort of added piece of leather in the back that really cups the heel and gives you that added support in the heel. That, is, um, is sort of tucked in and, and nailed together uh, in between the sole layers. So then you have this insole right up here that kind of protects the foot, of course, from all of these um, little hobnails that are sticking through. Those come up and they curl over like that. But of course, they're still not going to be the most comfortable thing if your foot is right on them. So then you have a nice thick insole that's going to cover that and make it a nice soft walking surface. That's a very typical type of construction. But as you can see right here, that's not the only type of construction. There's also sewn construction. You can see these thongs have been used to strap together all of those same kinds of layers. You've got some, these are parts of the uppers right here. Let me help you if it's difficult to, to figure out what's going on here. These are part of the uppers that they have a, you know, an edge that's, been, that's sewn in to then the sole layers, which is all this right here. Those sole layers are strapped together by a tunnel stitch right here. You can see that running. So you can have entirely sewn shoes. For the most part, what we have are what we would call sort of thonged and nailed, where you've got the nails holding all this together, but you also have a thong that's gonna go up and through in different patterns sometimes, that's gonna hold the sole units together, the sole layers together. And then that all comes out to create the parts of the shoe that you, that you need for wearing and, and, and walking. And that right here, you've got your hobnails that are in sometimes very utilitarian patterns. This is much more of a utilitarian pattern, though it has a nice little circle at the bottom. Um, you might just have lines and lines and rows of, 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 um, of studs there, but you also might have a nice little decorative pattern. So here you have a, a diamond uh, up, up, at the, up at the tread, we call it, underneath the ball of the foot. Um, others are incredibly intricate. In fact, you know, you've got scrolling patterns, and I'm sure that anyone who's visited the museum can, can in their mind's eye, imagine one of those. Um, they're, they're quite incredible, some of them. In fact, some of them you look at and you think, how in the world did you even walk on that? You know, because you've just got this little pattern up at the, up at the tread and maybe one at the heel, and, and it does actually seem to be quite uncomfortable. Um, I haven't tried it out myself, though some people have. There are some articles about that. So that's how you basically put the shoe together. Now, there are a couple of components that I want to talk about as well. What you're looking at here is what we call a carbatina, a single piece, a couple of different examples. This is literally just one single piece of thick cowhide that is, you know, forms the bottom of the, the sort of walking surface that you would put your foot in. You would then pull these sides right here. So these are splayed. So they're out in the archaeological record. They kind of go whoop. And you would then pull these sides, that's one of the sides, that's the other side, you pull it up. That right there is a seam, that there, and that there, an edge really, that's gonna come together to create a seam. Those two edges would be sewed together. And your heel is sitting right in there. So I hope that that explains things nicely for you. And the same kind of thing is happening here, but you have a nice big old hole right there at the, at the heel, as I said, happens quite often. Um, there's your seam, you pull these sides up, you sew it back, you sew it together in the end, and there you go. And then you need a lace. And so I put this image in so that you could see we actually do have some shoes that have the laces still. I mean, so wonderful. Um, through there, you know, lace it up, tighten it, loosen it, do whatever you want. You know, like I said, if you're 12 and you're suddenly 13 and your foot grew, loosen it up a bit. You can wear it, you can still probably wear it, get a little bit more uh, use out of it. So that's a, a single piece. And then from time to time, now, of course, on any archaeological site, we always want our objects to be in the best shape they can be. And we want them to comp be complete. And we want them to not fall apart. But sometimes with shoes, when you pull them out, and once you go through conservation and you get rid of the mud, they do fall apart a bit. And sometimes that's actually pretty cool because it allows us to really see inside of the shoe. So we can look at those inner workings. What you're looking at here is one that these are the same shoe right here. This is a picture I took with the outer sole kind of placed back on. So take that 
item right there where my cursor is, flip it over, put it onto the shoe, and that is what it looks like all together. However, once the mud, like I said, was taken away and that wasn't holding it together, it had come off. And we're really able to get in there and see what's going on. So it gives you a great example of that. Uh, the uppers have an edge that are sewn in. Now I should say as well that you do have, sometimes the uppers are in fact an entire layer right there, looking actually a lot more like this, where you have the whole foot layer and that would be a midsole layer of the shoe. So you'd have a, a tread sole underneath and an insole on top, and that would all be, you know, slam together, but you can imagine that that actually takes more leather. So if it's going to take more to manufacture, it's going to take more material, it's going to cost more. And so perhaps as a cost saving measure, they just move over to this, this um, just edging here where that would be nailed in and that would hold the uppers in. So the uppers have a little bit that go tucking in between these sole layers and you can really get a sense of that here. This is a similar kind of situation over here. You've got that nice long elongated insole that would have um, kind of flipped over. That was actually the inside part. And you can see that edge where you have the nails that came through. And then also sometimes in here, you can see some evidence for, for sewing that that would have been sewn together as well. So we really are able to get a good, good, a good sense of how these things are made. Um, I had mentioned in terms of how shoes are made in the different styles, the, the person that really thinks about this a lot is uh, Marquita Vulcan. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you can move in that direction. She has a whole book that you can find on the internet. Um, it's not terribly expensive, but a very, very big, thick book. Um, on the, the kind of construction of shoes and all the different styles um, through time as well, not just Roman. So really interesting. So the, the construction is something that we can learn a lot about, particularly, and I stress again, from the Vindolanda shoes, because the collection is so big that we can see all of these different, this range of, of styles and varieties and how things were done. Okay, now this is a question. One of the things I love about excavating at Vindolanda and this comes from excavators, um, is that you get all these different people, right? You might have bankers or, um, or uh, I can't even think of other professions, teachers and, you know, everybody from everywhere in the world. Like, do, do people do things that are not archaeology? Um, and we have had podiatrists who have been on site. Um, I, the, the, you, if, if you're out there, you know who you are, these lovely Scottish two women who came together and um, they were podiatrists and they had so many interesting questions and it actually pushed me to think, oh, you know, I should get a, a perspective from, from podiatry um, and, and something called pedorthy, which is an um, interesting part of, of podiatry as well. So did the Romans understand any concepts of podiatry? Now, I have one little article on this. Um, it's in a volume from a, a Newcastle conference that we had a couple of years ago. And that is about all of my knowledge. And this is where I love collaborating because, um, you know, first of all, when we have all of these great volunteers, they ask these amazing questions. So thank you to all of you out there um, to get us thinking about things. You really got input on this. And then secondly, it's for me to say, hey, who am I gonna collaborate with? Let's get some more ideas. Let's bring some more people and some more minds in on these questions. And so, in fact, I am collaborating with various people who will talk about this. So the, the article that I put together focused on these couple of things here. Um, and I should say, I keep citing these things. If anybody wants to email me, I'm very happy to send you a list of you know, things that I cited or off prints and things like that if I have them. Um, you know, And it's under copyright and all that business, but we'll work that out. Um, so my answer is that yes, the Romans actually did have a sense of podiatry. Now, to what extent, I can't say. Um, is this all we're going to see, um, or was there a lot? I've gone through the medical texts from, in both the Greek and Roman worlds, and they don't say too much, except that they did understand that, you know, if you were having, you know, foot problems, heat problems, you were really, you were going to struggle. So they did understand that, you know, foot health was important, but it's the actual archaeology. So again, where the Vindolanda assemblage comes in as so important, since we have so many shoes, we're bound to find these things. What you're looking at here, if you might be thinking, I don't think I'm looking at shoes, you're looking at metal bits that are put onto shoes. The one of the earliest ones to be found was this over here. Um, actually, I don't remember what number this is, maybe both of these. These are two different kinds of what we would call today orthotics, effectively. 
This one right here, you can probably make out that that's the heel of the shoe. And this is a little bit of leather that's stuck onto the shoe here. Um, and you can tell that from all that Vivianite that's all over it. But then there is a bar, there's an iron bar that came up and around, hooked into the shoe. So you had a nice solid connection there. And this can be nothing but a kind of podiatric fix for a, an individualized gait problem, as far as I can see. Um, we don't have the rest of the shoe, so I can't actually say whether this is maybe a supination or a pronation, whether they're pushing more on the outside or more on the inside, but they clearly seem to be fixing for a, a, a gait problem. And then equally over here, this little metal plate, which had it not been found with shoe studs in it, we might have just pondered, what is this metal plate? And we might not have known, but it was found with shoe studs in it. And you've got this curve right here. This is another kind of orthotic that they, a whole plate, I wish this was more complete because I would love to see how this looks. Um, but the whole plate was put, that looks to me like, probably more like the toe. That's a little bit of a, of a, of a that curve doesn't look right for the heel. Um, but fixing, again, some sort of whether you're wearing, as simple as you're wearing your shoe out on one part constantly, right? Because, and we all know this, right? All of us kind of either go this way or we go that way. Um, but if it's a real problem, it can be an issue with, with shoes. You need new shoes like every couple of months. Um, so they're fixing for that. And if you're curious and you're looking at this and you're thinking, you know what, Dr. Green, I don't believe you. I don't think that's what's going on here. Look at this one. I was so happy in 2007, we pulled out the whole shoe, yay, and the iron bar on the back as well. So that right there is blown up in this image and you've got that iron bar equally along the back. So I wonder if this is somebody who kind of dragged the heel, you know, kind of scuffed and dragged the heel for a variety of different health reasons. So another thing that the Vindalanda assemblage is really gonna help us with and some of my collaborations that were gonna be last summer, we were gonna come over and look at things, but um, are really looking at historical health outcomes from Roman shoes and, and trying to understand some of these issues of gait. I mean, one of the questions that I threw out to, I've been talking to a bunch of kinesiologists here at Western. We've got a really big kinesiology department at my university. And I kind of just wandered over there one day and was like, hey, Anyone interested in ancient shoes? They weren't, of course, but I made them interested. Um, but what, one of the things I said was, you know, we've got the most celebrated military, one of the most celebrated militaries in history here, the Romans. We talk about their, their marching and their incredible feats and this and that, but do we know remotely if they were doing this on, you know, good shoes, bad shoes? Were they all kind of hobbling around? Were they... Surely they're not, right? They're not gonna be all hobbling around, but I think there's some, there's something interesting to be said. Now, this has been discussed in the past and um, Carol and I recently, uh, or recently, now that's a couple of years ago, we're laughing about what somebody who tried to look at this, you know, figured out that 98% of the Roman army had, you know, some foot problem or another. Now we can't take it quite that far. I really don't think that the entire Roman army had issues, but it would be interesting to just sort of talk through and get that perspective um, from, from a kind of more modern focus and see what they can make of the ancient shoes. So that is something that we're walking on, we're uh, working on just now. So there are also these kind of interesting homespun remedies, um, some slightly more homespun than others. I'll start with this, the other adjustments. These things are called lamini here, the thing you're seeing on the right and the bottom. And what I mean by that are these little bits of, some of these are uppers, so don't look at all of these, but these little bits of, of leather, of midsole, insole, they did have um, these, these areas, they would boast, bolster, let's say, um, the, the um, arch of the foot, you know, how a lot of people have issues with, with arches or whether you have flat feet, something like that, it's more difficult, um, you know, you get more pain walking or an outer edge will be more, um, will be boosted. And now that's interesting because um, it's, it's a little bit hard to talk about because usually the shoe is either taken apart or it's either completely together and we're not going to take it apart to look at these lamini or it's completely apart and so it's hard for us to kind of put them back in the spot. So we do have some that are in between where maybe the tread sole is gone but the midsole layers are still clinging to the insole, um, something like that. And we can actually make out that they seem to have had a sense that you could boost particular parts of the, of the shoe sole. So that's nice. That's not homespun in the sense that you do have to actually think about that at the point of manufacturing. 
But we do have these interesting homespun remedies in the sense of extra studs being added to shoes. And you can see right here, there's a nice line of studs here, a nice line here, a nice line there, a nice line coming up here, and then the outer. This individual, though, decided simply not enough, and they added all of these right, oops, all of those right there, and they added these right in here. And we have actually quite a few shoes where you'll get that all on one side here or a whole bunch added down to the, you know, bottom inner sole of the, of the heel or something. So that seems to be something that you could kind of at home, or maybe you took it off to the cobbler and said, ah, you know, can you add some of these things here? Um, you know, I keep scraping this down or I need some more support on this one side. We have in the, in the, in the, in the tablets, I believe we have a price, we have the studs that the individual studs rather than just, you know, that whole shoes are actually coming into the fort. And then the other place we see this is in Diocletian's price edict. So that's um, Diocletian is one of the emperors um, in the Tetrarchy from the late third century. And he, this famous document, the price edict, where he set the prices for a number of, of commodities around the empire. And one of them was in fact, shoe studs. So we know that these things are moving around independently and you could buy them. We've got them in the Vindolanda stores. You could get them and you could perhaps, what it looks like from the archeology span rather than the texts, you could put them into your shoes and support your, your foot where you needed it. So that's quite cool as well. Okay, so there's podiatry. There's more to come on podiatry, I promise. There are gonna be some co-authored articles. So um, if you wanna hear more, which I know you do, <laughs> that, that will be coming out soon. Now, this is a popular question and, and that big blank space on the right, I was desperately looking for another picture that I simply couldn't find of another stamp we have at Mindalanda. Um, were the shoes made locally or were they imported? And I feel like I keep saying this, but it's going to be both again. So we probably have shoes being made within the fort. Some of the simpler shoes, we have a space that I've had a little post-it note to write up as an article for a long time. The, the cob, we call it the cobbler shop. In other words, it seems like the things that are coming out of it, um, the offcuts, the tools seem to be a cobbler shop, whether they're you know, fully making shoes from scratch or fixing shoes, you know, that'll be something to, to figure out. But it seems very likely that to a certain extent, some shoes are being made at Vindolanda. We don't, however, have um, tanneries. There, it looks like so far anyway, that the, the hides are coming in from elsewhere. We have the tablets that talk about hides coming into the fort. Um, who knows, someday we could find a tannery uh, outside of the fort, probably out in the field, but we have not had that sort of thing since. And, and uh, if, if Carol Vandrill Murray's on here, she'll be saying they're very hard to find. They are elusive, I believe is the title of one of the most recent books about it. So there's a book on tanneries from, I think, 2016, I think. Um, so it seems likely, though, that we've got some shoes being made at Vindolanda. Um, but we also have a ton that are certainly being imported, that are certainly coming up in, from merchants. Um, and it's cases like the one you see right here that make that pretty clear that at least, or people could be bringing them with them as well, right? You could have, you could have bought this really nice fancy shoe somewhere else and you bring it up with you when you, when you're, it arrives to Vindolanda with you. But this shoe is by far our most famous. So we call it the Lepidina slipper. Um, it's one of those cases where actually there's a really good argument for this being Lepidina's shoe. You know, in archaeology, we try not to make those leaps between texts and things. But in fact, we have this absolutely stunning shoe from the Praetorium for, that we know from the writing tablets is where Sulpicia Lepidina lived with um, her family, with the prefect. We, we know that the family's living there. And this shoe is stunning by all counts. And it is definitely definitely something that was imported. And one of the ways we know that is this right here. You've got a stamp in a lovely onsate panel. That's that rectangle with the little um, inverted triangles that come in. Um, and that is a stamp of Lucius Ibutius Thales. So he's a shoemaker and he's got a Greek name, as you can see as well, Greek and Latin. Um, he's, he's, he's definitely got some Greek in him. And that stamp is repeated, in fact, on the shoe elsewhere here, here, and then up closer that, that is being obscured by the upper. And then you can also make out these lovely, um, are those oak leaves? Anyway, they're leaves. Um, and you've got a couple of those here. 
Uh, that is a very lovely shoe. Now, it's not the only one that we have the maker's stamp on it. So we we presume that Lucius Ibutius Davies is the shoemaker. He's proud of his work. He puts this on. You know, we've kind of, we joke and say this is our first Prada or whatever the, you know, Jimmy Choo. I don't know. I'm probably completely dating myself. I like to go with Doc Martin. Let's just say this is the first Doc Martin. That, that's my kind of style show. Um, but, you know, this is a designer label we have here. We do have another one that um, is on display in the, in the museum. That's why I don't have a great picture of it, actually. Um, I've got to do that next time, Barb. Um, it's a lovely little square um, uh, stamp. And, and the coolest thing about it, it's hard to say who, who the maker is because it's actually quite cryptic. It's just got a couple of letters around each that don't equal a word. Um, I do have somebody on the task though that I want, I'm hoping we'll come up with some idea on this one. The cool thing about that one is that it is repeated the exact stamp in New York. So we know that these things are kind of moving around. It's pretty doubtful that this would have been somebody working at Vindolanda. I mean, I think we can say that probably both the York shoe and the Vindolanda shoe came from somewhere else. So we know we've got some very, very nice imported shoes. We also know that we've got some just regular shoes that we wouldn't maybe necessarily say are imported, but perhaps came up with merchants from elsewhere um, in, you know, in the empire or in the in, in Britain, you know, it's hard to say. Um, so that's the story on shoes, whether they're made locally or imported. I will write up that cobbler space though, and, um, and, I'll, and I'll hopefully be able to share that with everybody at some point. <laughs> the list is getting long, Andy, the list is getting long. Okay, number nine, I hope I'm not doing too bad. Okay, three minutes to an hour, I've got two more. Did shoes mark the status of the owner? Like, were they, can we perhaps say that they were in a servile class, perhaps saying they were a slave or, or um, the flip side of that, or do shoes suggest that somebody was very, very elite? Okay, so this is, uh, yes, we have, we have all of this. We have everything in between. There are definitely shoes, as we just noted with the Lepidina slipper, that you have shoes that are very elite, that indicate both from where they're from and what they look like and who we also know from other Vindolanda evidence live there. You've got a shoe that belonged to an elite individual, absolutely. Now, way back when I was doing my PhD, I had a professor say to me, well, how do you know with something like that that the shoe wasn't like handed down from, say, you know, the mistress of the house down to a servant or a slave? And you know, at the time, because you get very nervous when you're doing your PhD, and, you, and I froze. But you know what the answer is? The answer is that footwear is very telling in the Roman world. Footwear and other things, like the rings that you're wearing, the color of your toga, the thing, those all express status. Those are all outward symbols, and shoes particularly. So a lot of you will probably have heard before that um, the senators in Rome wore bright red boots. The equestrians wore black boots, and this was an indication of their status. Now, by no means should we imagine senators in Rome running around every day, all day in red boots. That's, that's not going to be, this is a symbolic thing, and probably this is true to a certain extent. They had um, a, a purple stripe on their togas, and that indicated status. It is legislated in Roman law, who could wear a gold ring, who could wear a silver ring, who could only wear an iron ring. And these are sartorial, not choices, but things that are actually designated and legislated in the Roman world. And shoes are the same way. Shoes give you, you couldn't, if you were just a slave, you couldn't run around in those red boots, never. So that's actually, I think the answer is that you couldn't just sort of pass off this very nice shoe. Now, at the same time, does every shoe express status? Probably not. But I think that there is a, um, a range that we can talk about here. One of the problems is that once you get sort of down below a certain point, there's no way to tell if this is being worn by a slave or a just kind of regular foot soldier or, um, you know, a man or a woman even actually. Once you get to a certain type of shoe, they all look the same. We can look at the size and try to make some, you know, some, 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 um, not guesses, but to get the indication of who was wearing it. But with the styles, sometimes um, it's a little bit more difficult. Now, one thing I want to point out, though, you're looking at two shoes right here that I would say indicate a different kind of status level. You have a really nice shoe over here. This is one from 2019, from that early ditch in 2019. 
Um, really nice shoe. You've got these triangular cutouts. And then you have over here, you're basically bog standard military boot. You just have your lace holes, very practical for the, the, the um, you know, British weather. There are some of these shoes I've shown, you're probably thinking, really, would you be wearing those right now? Practically, you know, uh-uh, definitely not, right? People had lots of different shoes for different occasions, just like we do now. But when you think about it, that shoe on the left and that shoe on the right essentially do the same exact thing. They are essentially the same shoe. They are both a military boot with some lace holes. But over here, this one, for whatever reason, required some nice fancy stuff. They wanted a little bit more to that boot. And so in that sense, I think that we can start talking about shoes indicating a kind of uh, social status, a level at which one, one sits. Um, this is going to cost a little bit more because you've got all of this intricate work. How much more time would it have taken, to, you know, really to cut all of this out? Now, they're probably, they probably have good mechanisms to do this. They're not, you know, individual scissors. Um, but it is going to take a lot more. There's, there's a lot more going on here. It's the same exact amount of leather because, of course, this has to start out looking like that, basically. And then you have to cut everything out, right? Um, so you do have a, a differential status, I believe, in the footwear here. Now, the other thing is we can look at all of those bog standard shoes. And this is what I meant. I mean, these all look gorgeous to us, don't they? I mean, these are nearly 2000 year old shoes and we think absolutely fantastic. But in fact, this right here was a, just a regular old shoe. You've got some small lace holes. You're going to lace it up. There's nothing that interesting going on here. And then these two on the bottom, just a reminder again of all of the shoes that we have that we don't have any idea what style they were and what they looked like and you know whether it was was expressing any kind of status. When we just have the soles, we can think about things like um, certain kinds of decoration. And I'll move to that next slide there. Um, you've got little incised cutouts on a shoe like this. That gives it a little extra something, doesn't it? You've got this sort of cutout here also, a little extra something in the upper, or the stamp. So this is right on the insole. So if we only have the insole, one way we can start to understand perhaps a little bit more of a decorative detail, decorative elements, are in the stamps. And this is the same shoe. Um, I, Andy, I don't know if you remember, we found this together. This was a 2006 shoe. Very beginning, it's number one, it's 2006 number one and we pulled that out it's in horrible condition but that stamp just it's from the rampart and we both just went oh look at that we don't have any other stamps that have oh, this is a, a perfectly normal component but all of these little you know kind of feathers coming out here that's actually pretty cool I like that one a lot um so you can embellish these these shoes with with different things um you know cutouts on the upper stamps on the lower but the other way to embellish, and I just want to point out so that I want to jump back to those kind of fishnet cutout shoes and look at this right here. We have a sock from Vindolanda and there are other socks from the ancient world. Um, I'd like to think the Vindolanda one is the most amazing one. There are, there's a little pair of red socks that are pretty darn impressive. Um, must be from a desiccated uh, environment. So I'm going to guess sort of, you know, Middle East or North Africa. Um, but the Vindolanda sock, we know they're wearing socks. I also put up this little foot right here, actually not so little bronze, but where it seems like there's a sock in there, right? You've got that sort of um, suppleness in there and there's no toe differentiation. So they're wearing socks. Now, the reason I point that out is that here at Vindolanda, when you're trying to give more to your footwear and say, and, and have your footwear do more for you symbolically, what can you do? You can, you can have all these cutouts, you can also wear a sock that's going to be bright red. We have all these questions about whether they dyed shoes and we're hoping we're working with a team of chemists from Teesside University and we're hoping that one of the questions that will eventually get answered is, you know, can we see if we've got any elements of, of dyes in these shoes? Now, um, you can wear, however, if we, we don't know about dyes yet, you can wear a brightly colored sock. And we do know that they had brightly colored socks. And you can put, let's say, a red sock under there and you can get that sartorial expectation of that red for a certain kind of status, right? Status individual. So there's more you can do. And I really do think that, um, that, that, they're, that they're doing this. I think that they're embellishing and they're, they're sending more sartorial symbolism 
with their footwear than, than we can even know about right now. And I was laughing so hard when I was looking for this image. I just wanted a good one. So I'm Googling, you know, socks and Roman socks and sandals. And all you find is like the, the horrible fashion faux pas of socks and sandals, which seems to be very strong in the UK. It is also very strong in the US. And in fact, my, my own father, for the for the one of the events around my wedding, uh, uh, you might even remember this, Andy. The the um, rehearsal dinner. Then you have a little dinner with the people who are you know. And my dad comes out wearing socks and sandals because it was you know summertime. It's warm out, and I was like, "No, Dad, what are you thinking?" And you know, I made him. I made him go back in and change the socks and sandals. Um, but the Romans didn't seem to have any problem with this whatsoever, and I think they're probably utilizing that as a, a way of, of sending symbolic messages that, that were really done through clothing and, and those choices. Okay, so I know we're, we're practically up and that's, that's great because the easy question is the last one. What's your favorite shoe and why? And I've already actually shown this one. And anybody who's heard me talk actually knows that this is my favorite shoe. Um, oddly enough, I think I found it. I have a picture of it from the field. It's from 2004, I believe. But this is one of my absolute favorite shoes. And that's because of the cutout, the back cutout. It's an adolescent. So let's just say somewhere between 10 and 14. It's hard to, to know exactly. But that cutout cracks me up because when I was a kid, I used to always stomp down the back of my shoes. And I bet many of you watching have had the same experience. You would, you would just need to slip your shoes on to nip outside for something and you would stomp down the back, but it would break down the shoes quicker. And my parents would get so mad. My mom every time would say, Elizabeth Marie Green, don't do that. She would get so mad at me. And I'm picturing this young, I don't know whether it's a, a, a young guy or young girl. And, um, you know, doing that and the mom yells over and over again, we're not buying you new shoes. And they said, right, fine, I'm just gonna cut the back out then. <laughs> I'll show you. And they just got rid of it. So this is just one of my favorite shoes. I think it's wonderful. I, if, if I didn't find it myself, I was right there when it was found. Um, it's, just a, it's just a great item, but it's, it's hard with the Vindalana shoes to pick your very favorite. And I bet we all have our own. And I bet anyone who's found one is like, well, that's my favorite naturally. Um, but I just think that tells a great story about, you know, the people that live there, whether it's, you know, right or wrong, it's my story that I like to tell about this shoe.